All right, let's keep moving then. Let's flip over the page or just move on to the next page to session number two. And let me just pray again as we start session number two. God, we want to be a church that lives up to the calling of Scripture, where it's everybody all the time. Each part of the body is doing what it's supposed to do, God. And even for us, God, that it's more than just checking a box and meeting practical needs. That's so important. But that there's a love and a care for other people. And God, that we are ministering to one another and helping each other grow, God. And so we just lift this up to you and ask now as we continue to talk about this, God, that you would make us the kind of people that you want us to be. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. So the goal is, and I think for every Christian, to some extent, that you are a spiritual leader. And that might, not every Christian is going to be, you know, a pastor or a life group leader or leading a ministry, but every Christian should be being used by God to influence other people and hopefully to make the people around you more like Christ, right? We're all in the process of discipleship, becoming more like Jesus, while at the same time, we're in the process of helping other people do the same thing and hopefully even passing it on to people that don't know Christ. That's where we all are. Now, these next two sessions, sessions two and three, really aren't going to have anything to do with other people. We're going to get there. But we need to start really by just talking about you. And that's an important thing. So session number two, if you want to jot down the title, is who you are greater than what you do. Who you are is greater than what you do, right? I could say, hey, we should all be encouraging one another, building one another up, and let me give you 20 tested, tried and true techniques on how to do that, right? If we did that, we'd be skipping something really important because no amount of technique, no amount of advice can make up really for character and for who you are and for godliness. And we're gonna, the main place we're going to look in session number two is 1 Timothy. So please take your Bibles and open up to 1 Timothy, and we're going to look at chapter 3 and, and kind of move on from there. Because when the Bible starts talking about leaders, I mean, depending on the different role, there are some skills that are required. But the main emphasis always is on character. That is what God prizes most highly in his leaders. And there can be somebody that's an amazing preacher, you know, super gifted at teaching. But if their character is not godly, even just in the privacy of their own homes and their own hearts, that's going to fall apart. But you might have a a preacher that, hey, is is godly when no one else is watching. And he might not be the, you know, most polished speaker in the world. But man, God's going to use that person, right? Because that's where the biblical focus is. If you're in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it starts talking about even specific offices, I guess you could say, positions in the church. And it starts off there in verse 1 saying, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. And there's a few words that I think are used interchangeably throughout the New Testament or where we get the English words from, like overseer, elder, pastor. That's talking to one office. It should be one group of men that are leading the church. And so it's describing, hey, Timothy, as you're starting churches, you need to appoint these overseers, these elders. This is what you should look for. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, right? Do you see all of that? We, we, we saw something in there. Okay, there's this definite skill that they need to have. They need to have the ability to teach, but pretty much everything else on the list, it's their character. What kind of person are they? And it's not, well, hey, do they have a lot of money? Do they have a lot of, you know, experience? Uh, Are they, you know, really good managers and organizers? No, it's, are they 
the people of the right character. And and then move on to verse 8. It starts talking about deacons, which sometimes when we translated the Bible from Greek into English, they just kind of took Greek words and took those letters and moved them into English. I mean, deacon literally means servant or, or minister. And sometimes it's even translated that way. And it can be a difficult word, even biblically, because sometimes it seems like the Bible talks about deacons almost with a capital D, that this is some kind of official position in the church. And then sometimes it seems like it talks about it with, you know, a little d, where every Christian, I mean, even we talked in session number one about 1 Peter 4, 10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. The word serve there is the verb form of deacon, right? So it's basically saying, hey, every Christian should be a deacon, but clearly then there's some that are set apart for specific roles in the church in this way. But then, okay, what's the requirement for these people? Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves to be really skilled at whatever it is they're doing. Is that what it says? No. Prove themselves blameless. It's about character. Now let's keep moving. Move on to chapter 4. Chapter 4. Again, he's, he, remember, Paul is now at this point probably a little bit older. He's done a lot of ministry. Timothy is probably a younger man who now is... Uh, Paul's in some ways passing the baton and he's teaching him about ministry. Pick it up in chapter 4, verse 6. Saying, hey, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. So there he's highlighting something else. Hey, we have to be teaching the right things. We have to be believing the right things. Sound doctrine. But then look at verse 7. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. And now we, we see there he's saying, hey, Timothy, you need to teach the right things. These are things you need to do. But Timothy, let me tell you, train yourself for godliness. You, you need to have character that reflects the character of God. That's maybe a way to sum up what godliness means, that your character is a reflection of the character of God. Another way we would maybe refer to that in our churches is we need to be Christ-like, right? That, like Christ in our attitudes and our actions. And he's saying, hey, Timothy, work on this. Focus on this. This will be a lot more important than being physically fit, which, hey, that, that has some benefits too. But more important than that is how healthy is your soul? And then he gets to a well-known verse there, 1 Timothy 4.12 which says, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Right? He's saying, hey, be the example, Timothy. And the verse is, this verse is famous more for that first part. Hey, Timothy, don't let anybody despise you for your youth. And I've spoken on this to high school students and college students, right? Saying, hey, young people, you're important in Scripture. But here's the thing. If we look at this and we look at, okay, what is he telling him to be an example with? That has nothing to do with age. Whether you're a young man like Timothy or whether you're the oldest person in the room today, if we're to be setting an example, it still comes down to these same things. And when we talk about spiritual leadership, The first way we always want to be leading others is leading by example, right? No matter who you are. And and that's the thing. Lots of times we think of discipleship strictly in terms of older people leading younger people, right? And clearly look at Titus 2. That's a pattern we want to see happening in the church is older people investing in younger people. But I don't think discipleship is limited 
to that. I mean, look at all the one another's in the Bible, right? We're ministering to one another. And it's not always going to be, I mean, even Timothy, he was the leader of this church and he was by no means the oldest person there. But Paul was saying, hey, Timothy, lead by example. And that's a lot of what spiritual leadership looks like. Sometimes it does look like, hey, I've been there. I've been where you've been. Here's how I dealt with it. Follow what I have done in the past. But lots of time, what spiritual leadership looks like is, hey, we're getting together. I'm putting my arm around you, and I'm saying, hey, we're going that way, and I'm going to help set the pace as we run together this race of discipleship. I mean, that's a picture we need to think more about. And that is where you want to think of yourself as a spiritual leader. Think of yourself as a spiritual pace setter, right? That you're helping set the direction and the speed that others should follow. And that's always going to start with character, who you are. And so I want us to walk through these different things, because this is what Paul is telling Timothy. Hey, these are the areas that I want you to to show that example. Let's look at them one at a time. First, it says in speech, the things that we say should set the example for others. And that starts with, if you want to be a spiritual leader, there are some things that should never come out of your mouth. I mean, even starting with the most basic, going all the way back to the Ten Commandments, we shouldn't take the Lord's name in vain. Colossians chapter 3 says, hey, there shouldn't be you know, any filthy talk coming out of our mouth. Profanity, right? Or obscenity, or, or just talking about things that are dirty, right? That's not how a leader should be talking. There should be no gossip or bitter talk or slander coming out of a spiritual leader's mouth. No explosive anger or lies. But we do want to see, write down Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. When we gather as a church on Sunday morning, do you set the example? Do you gather with a life group throughout the week? Or in your job, maybe you work with other Christians, or maybe you're just setting the example of Christ in a pagan workspace. What's coming out of your mouth? Now, why is this important? In a lot of these, he's going to be talking about our actions, but every single one of them, where do our actions come from? Jesus said, for out of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? What we are saying with our mouths shows what's going on in our hearts. And that's something that we're going to talk about in two weeks as we think about leading others, is we need to understand it's not just about behavior, it's about the heart. That's why what we say is so important. Set the example in speech. Next, set the example in conduct. Think of chapter 3. What was the first thing about the, the overseer, the pastor? has to be above reproach. What was the first thing about the deacon? Well, the deacon needs to be dignified. They handled themselves appropriately, rightly. And then we see that contrasted. The the leader shouldn't be a drunkard. It shouldn't be out of control. Shouldn't be a a lover of money and just, you know, dominated by materialism and possessions, right? Our conduct should be above reproach. And again, it all comes back to the heart. It comes back to really, who are you when nobody's watching? What's your conduct then? Setting the example in speech, in conduct. Third, in love. Setting the example in love. And this is huge. And I think this is something that we're going to have to devote a whole session to next time. Because this is essential for leadership. You have to be, you have to care. You have to genuinely care about other people. And even just think of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right? It doesn't matter what skills you have. It doesn't matter what knowledge you have if, I mean, I'm not saying those aren't important, but it is unimportant if you don't have love. If you don't have love, you're a zero. You've got nothing, right? If you want to be a spiritual leader, you have to care about other people. And let's just be clear about something else. Spiritual leadership 
has zero to do with bossing other people around. That that has nothing to do with real, godly, spiritual leadership. Look at exhibit A, God's plan for the husband. Does God want the husband to be a leader? Yes, amen, hallelujah. That's what the Bible teaches. Does that mean that the husband should ever be bossing around his wife? No, may it never be. How is the husband supposed to lead his wife with an iron fist and authority? No, with the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. You want to lead others? It's going to have very little to do with you having authority and power and telling people do this or do that and a lot to do with you laying down your life for them. And even look carefully, read First and Second Timothy, see how Paul instructs Timothy even to act. Just real briefly, First Timothy 2, he's warning him to, hey, how do you deal with troublemakers, with problem people? Verse 23, 2 Timothy 2, 23, he says, Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know they breed quarrels. Hey, Timothy, I don't want you fighting with all these people. The Lord's servant must be, not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Right? Even when you're correcting somebody who is just straight up wrong, you do it with gentleness, you do it with care, you do it because you love that person. And even though sometimes we're going to see in Scripture, hey, there comes a point where a believer, if they're just walking in unrepentant sin, they need to be kicked out of the church and disciplined, right? But even then, the goal is always we want to win them over. We want to see them walking with Christ. And if you're going to lead others, if you're going to influence others, you're going to have to lay down your life for them. It's not going to be convenient. It's going to cost you emotionally, It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you money. It's going to open you up to being uncomfortable, exposed. And there's going to be people that you do everything for, and they're going to turn around and stab you in the back. And the Christian leader says, well, that's kind of what they did to Jesus, so I guess I'm doing something right. And doesn't get angry about it, doesn't get bitter about it, and doesn't then, well, shut down because I had a bad experience. I'm going to continue being faithful to love other people. And that starts right now. Do you show up to church on Sunday morning more focused on who's going to talk to you? Or do you show up to church on Sunday morning saying, who can I bless? Who can I reach out to? That's the attitude we all need. And it can start with things as simple as that. You showing that you care about other people. Start with you praying for other people. Showing that you care. Set the example in speech, in conduct, in love in faith. Faith is really a defining feature of the Christian life, and we're going to talk about it later this morning, how that's one of the main biblical responses we see highlighted to the gospel. How do you become a Christian? You have to have faith. But one thing I always want our church to know is faith is more than just how somebody becomes a Christian. Romans 1 says the right doesn't just say, hey, the righteous are saved by faith. It says the righteous shall live by faith. The Christian life starts with faith, and then it continues with faith all the way to the end. Every day, you're going to basically be asked the question, do you trust Jesus or not? Is your faith really in him or not? When it comes to when you're tempted, or when you're anxious, or or whatever it might be, do you trust Jesus? And the leader should have a healthy confidence and trust in God right? That no matter what's going on in their lives, they're, they're showing, hey, I know God is in control. There's, there's a steadiness that a leader should have that's grounded in, hey, my heart is trusting in God. And that's ultimately what drives us to obedience. I believe God, therefore, I will do what he says. I will obey his commands because I believe and I trust that God knows what he's doing and that what he says is what's best for me. So I will do what he says. And finally, the last way he tells him to be an example is in purity. 
which could also be translated chastity. And if the first place we go when we hear that is sexual purity, that, that's, that's where we should go. A life that is pure in a world that is very, very sexually immoral. And it's unfortunate that probably one of the most, maybe the most common ways you see people get disqualified from some kind of ministry or spiritual leadership is impurity, right? That's something that all, anybody, even just down to the average person in the church, if you want to be used by God, He wants you to be pure. And we need to understand that the standard here is high. It's not just, well, I've always been faithful to my spouse, or if I'm single, I'm, I'm pure and I'm, uh, I'm not giving in. It's, well, what am I thinking? What am I doing when nobody is watching? I'm taking pure. I don't watch what is impure. I don't think about what is impure because God is real. He is holy. And I take that seriously. And again, all of these really come back to your heart. Paul is telling Timothy, hey, be the example in all these kinds of things, because if you are, it's going to show that your heart is in the right place, right? And if there's a problem in these things, really the issue is the heart. But Timothy, I want you to be showing these things. And if we went back to chapter 3 of 1 Timothy and looked at the overseer and the deacon, we would see what's the, the kind of the primary testing ground for a lot of these things. It's your home. Right? It's not so much, hey, on Sunday morning, are you setting the example in speech, in conduct, in faith, in love, in purity? Right? Trust me, anybody can put on a face on Sunday morning. People do it all the time. You know where it gets a lot harder to put on a face? At home. Right? When your guard is down, when you're with the people who, sure, you love the most, but maybe get under your skin the most. And again, that might look different for different people in the room. What, what stage of life that you're in, but that when, when, when the world isn't watching, when, when not everyone is there to see, what's your character like then? That's the, the kind of character that God wants in a leader. Hey, you're following me when no one else is watching. You're the kind of person that I'm going to use to be an example and to influence other people. And that's why everyone in this room, if you're saying, hey, I want to lead others, step one before we get to them is discipline yourself for godliness. Work on your character. That's something that will pay benefits not just in this life, but for eternity. And I think part of that is because if we do that, we're going to have an investment in others that's going to bear fruit in eternity. Again, looking at what Timothy says, in 2 Timothy In verse 20, it says, in chapter 2, verse 20, it says, Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with all who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So at the end of this session, instead of asking me questions, I want to ask you some questions. And I want you to take about five minutes and just right now, while we're still thinking about it, I want you to talk to God right now. And even to think about your speech, your conduct, your love, your faith, your purity, and say, God, make me the person that you want me to be. God, are there ways that I'm not setting the example in any of these things? And God, if I am, I want to turn from those, and I want you to change my heart and make me more like Christ.